Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, you know, we've been going through the Gospel of John for a while now. Um, I think the past year, actually. Um, and I was looking at how many messages we've gone through, and it's it's over 45, I think, now. So 45 messages just going through the scriptures of the Gospel of John. And we're actually coming now just to the closing last two chapters. Um, this is um, the second to the last message, and the next message will pretty much finish off um, the Gospel of John. Um, but it's important to realize, you know, as we come to these last you know, chapters of John, and as we come to these last, you know, events of the life of Jesus and his resurrection, of course, um, these are actually the most significant events in the history of our world. Um, and they have actually the greatest importance, especially to our spiritual walk of faith. Um, you know, looking back on the cross, if the cross and that message and what happened there, if the cross is the most important event in relation to our salvation, then the resurrection is the most important event in relation to our faith. So the cross is important for our salvation, but the resurrection is very important for our faith. Um, in fact, the resurrection is kind of the hinge upon which all of our faith stands. You know, if there was no resurrection, if there was no resurrection, then everything about the identity of Jesus, who he was, what he came to do, can all be put into question. Most of it can be written off as simply the words of another religious leader, or maybe he was just a prophet. Um, at worst, you know, when he claims to be one with God or to be God, um, you could say that maybe he was just a crazy person. His teachings about our life would be no more effective than the words of any other religious teacher. Buddha, Gandhi, Muhammad. Um, they would all be the same. He would simply be another teacher with another set of rules that eventually died. Leaving us no better off than we were and simply with yet another way to try to save ourselves. But, and that's a big but, but if he did resurrect, as he prophesied he would, and as scriptures foretold, then that evidence and proof is great enough to bring all of his words into validity. That not only the truth of his words, but also what comes with that, the authority and the power that backs them up. For if he did truly resurrect, that means that when he says, your sins are forgiven, your sins are truly forgiven, he has the authority and power to do that. When he says, whoever believes me shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you do indeed believe, you will have eternal life. When he identified himself as one with God, that means he is indeed God. Thus, with this one event, the resurrection, the truth of it validates all of our faith claims and our hopes in Christ. For our faith, this is the most important event regarding its validity and truth. And I'm kind of stressing this a lot right now, and stressing this today because you know, I've met a lot of Christians who are struggling with kind of wandering. They have a lot of questions about their faith. Sometimes they'll get to a point where they say, you know, Christianity is just like every other religion. It's all the same. And I've met people like this. You know, I was thinking about, as I was preparing this message, I was thinking about um, a friend of Daniel, one of our old members, and one of his friends that I met. You know, we went out to lunch together, and as we were walking to the coffee shop from where we ate, we were actually talking about this exact subject. You know, he had a lot of questions regarding things. He had stopped going to church for a while. He grew up Catholic. But the important thing for him was he was still seeking the truth. You know, he didn't give up. He wasn't numb to things. He was still seeking the truth. And so we were having an honest conversation about things. And I brought him to this point of the importance of the resurrection. And the point being, yeah, when we talk about the gospel, there's a lot of grace behind it. But we don't look at the flip side if you reject the truth of the gospel. You know, when we present the gospel and its truth, to deny it brings about very scary conclusions. Because of this point, if Jesus claimed to be God, if he claimed to forgive sins, if he said he is the way, the truth, and the life, and the exclusive way to the Father, that if he did resurrect from the dead, as scriptures and he himself prophesied, then the only conclusion is that his word is truth. 
And if all that he said is true, then to not believe in him is, re is rejecting the truth. To not believe him is actually rejecting God himself. And thus, the results are justifiable. And basically, in the end, it doesn't really matter what people's beliefs are. They can believe that there are many paths to God. They can believe that, you know, the only thing they should do is love other people. They can believe that meditation is the key to enlightenment and a better life. Or they can believe that ridding themselves of all their wants and desires is the best thing. You know, they can even believe that, you know, they can fly. And it doesn't really matter. They can have outlandish beliefs. But if it doesn't match with God and His given way of salvation, then these are all invalid. If there is no authority from heaven to back them up, then they are all false. And based off the words of Jesus Christ, who claims to be God, they are, in fact, all invalidated ways of salvation. They are false ways. He proves this truth through his life, his death, and his resurrection. It's all in fulfillment of God's word, and it demonstrates that it has the power of God to back it up. And so it comes down to a choice. You either believe this truth or accept the lies of the world. But you have to live and die with the consequences especially if you reject that truth. And so today, we're going to look at the evidence of the resurrection. And we're going to look at the empty tomb, the witnesses, and also the response of one of the skeptics. So the first point I want to look at today is regarding the empty tomb. And we're looking at the start of our passage, which is John chapter 20, verse 1. It says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene, went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Okay, so at the start, this is the first day of the week. Um, you know, this would put it, the resurrection on a Sunday. So if you follow the timeline events, you know, he was crucified on Friday. Saturday was the Sabbath. And now Sunday is the first day of the week. It's the day he is resurrecting. And this is why, you know, many people ask, you know, why do we worship on a Sunday as Christians when the traditional Sabbath day is a Saturday? Um, this is the reason. The reason as a church we worship on Sunday is because this is the day Christ resurrected. This is the day where, you know, we worship Christ a victory over our sins. Amen. Right? So this is the day we worship. This is the day that Christ resurrected. Um, and this is the, the day that they first saw that there was the empty tomb. And so we see the first, permanent, first person sorry, coming to this tomb is Mary Magdalene. And she was one of Jesus' women followers. She comes to this tomb early in the morning. But what does she see when she arrives? The stone had been moved away. Now this is not an easy task. This is a very large, heavy stone that you know, two or three people would usually take to move. We see the stone is moved away. And she believes that it was grave robbers that had visited the tomb. So if we continue on in verse 2. It says, So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, which is John, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Right? So at this point, everyone's thought is, the body of Jesus had been stolen. And in Matthew, actually, in the Gospel of Matthew, we see the guards that were actually instructed to guard this tomb, they were actually paid to... You know, few of this story as well spread this news around that oh, the disciples came in the night; they stole his body. And here we see this is even what the disciples are thinking: someone may have stolen the body. The point is, the possibility of the resurrection of Jesus had not even entered their minds yet. So, verse three, continuing on. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, still lying in its place, separate from the linen. So there's a bit of shock when the disciples come to the scene. 
Um, and this actually, for them, this is a scene of a crime. The body is presumably stolen, but here, when they're seeing this scene of the situation, there's some details that I think, I think only maybe a detective would actually find noticeable. And this is actually starting to point to actually what really happened with Jesus. If you examine the scripture, things don't really add up. For example, if there really was a grave robbery, there would be a mess of things. It would have been done in haste to rush out. But here, the scene is quite orderly. You know, the linen, the cloth that Jesus had been wrapped in, it's folded, it's put in order. Everything's arranged nicely. And so this is kind of the first clue that something other than a robbery may have happened here. And actually, in fact, one of the disciples, even at this time, he already notices the significance of this. And it says this in verse 8. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had risen from the dead. Okay, so I have to stop here because we have to show the importance regarding the order of what is happening. You know, verse 29, it points out a very significant point. Verse 29. This point, it makes actually this story of what's happening more credible. Regarding the resurrection of Jesus, the witness of things happened before they connected it to Scripture. So they witnessed the things, they experienced the things before it was connected to Scripture. And so through the evidence and their eyewitness accounts, they came to believe. And it's only later that they saw that this fulfills scriptures. And like I said, the order of things is important because this point points to the fact that they didn't try to force the scripture. Right? If they already knew in their minds, hey, you know, Jesus had to resurrect, they would try to force the scriptures to fit things. Or they would try to fit their witness and their accounts to fit the scriptures. But we see their understanding of things comes later. The disciples didn't act or do things intentionally to fulfill God's word. They didn't force Jesus to be the Messiah. There was evidence. There were witnesses. Later, it was verified to be God's plan and discovered it was all based on his prophesied word. So thus, this empty tomb and its condition, this is the initial evidence that tells us either Jesus' body was moved or he did resurrect. And there's an easy way to tell which is correct. Does Jesus appear? Are there witnesses of the resurrected Jesus? And so that's the second point we're looking at today, is the witnesses. So continuing on, verse 20. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the other foot. They asked her, Woman, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. So Mary is weeping, she's wailing, um, she's really struggling, dealing with this fact that, you know, the body of Jesus has been taken away. Um, she's at a loss because she doesn't know where the body is. Um, even these angels she sees, you know, she didn't necessarily see them as angels. She might have just seen them as people, which a lot of times angels represent and appear as. Um, but she's simply at a loss regarding, she deeply wanted to see the body of Jesus. But continue on, verse 14. It says, as she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. So you see, right after the resurrection, Jesus is not recognized. You know, she could have been so focused on the missing body that she didn't really look at the person that was talking to her. Or it could have been that Jesus actually kept 
his identity hidden, which is something we see in a different gospel. When he's walking with two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he also kept his identity hidden from them. But either way, Mary believed this was simply a garter that may have moved the body of Jesus. So we come to verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And this is kind of cool. With one word, Jesus opens the eyes of Mary to see and know the truth. Her eyes to see his true identity are open simply by saying Mary at that moment. And it's kind of cool because this is the power of the word. It's the same power that brings life to the dead Lazarus. It's the power of life. It's the power of creation. To open the eyes of people. To have them truly see the things and the way they are. In verse 17, Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have yet for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go and said to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So we see Mary, she's so desperate to see him, she has this tendency to really grab onto him, never let him go. You know, she craves nearness to him. But for Jesus, this is not the time, right? You know, he has to return to his Father. And so we see there's kind of a warning here that Jesus is giving. And the warning is, is kind of not to let our human sympathies overcome the work of God. And you know, what comes to mind is if you guys can remember Peter. You know, when, when Jesus explains that he has to suffer and die on the cross, what does Peter say to him? No, no, no. This must never happen. And what does Jesus do? Jesus actually rebukes him. You know, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because he says, Peter only has in mind the things of man, not the things of God. And so I think there's like a small application for us within this regarding our worldly sympathies. You know, they can a lot of times lead us, especially in the missions field and with others, to make human elevation the priority of all our evangelism endeavors. We seek to provide for the needs of people. We seek to provide for the education of the people. You know, in the mission field, these things are important, right? To help people out, to help them out of their situations. But this is the warning. It should never replace the work God sends us to do. And I think, sadly, there's so many you know, missionary organizations, so many works where this has happened. Even churches. Churches where their theology became more about liberation theology and about human uplifting ministries, more social rights oriented. And I'm not saying these are bad things. These are all good things, right? As Christians, we should do these things. But that's not the core of the church. That not, that's not the primary message. That's not our primary goal. Now, a lot of times, these groups that had good intentions, in the end, they just become another secular organization. I mean, for example, YMCA. You know, that started as a Christian organization for helping young men, right? But it's just a, a secular place you go now to work out. It's like an exercise, like another gym. There's a lot of missionary organizations that started out really to proclaim Christ, to save lives. But what did they become? They became another NGO, just another way to help people. Which is good, of course. These things are needed. But it shouldn't be the primary work for missions. You know, one is a help that is temporary. The other is a help that is eternal. You know, one is a temporary blessing to the person. The other becomes a wellspring of blessings. And that wellspring of blessings pours out to their friends, their family, and to others. But this is the warning that Jesus is giving us. You know, the work of God, it takes priority even over our human sympathies. We continue on in our passage, verse 18. Mary Magdalene went to the other disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So she, Mary Magdalene, is the first witness of Christ. 
They see the first witness of the gospel, the good news. I have seen the Lord. And this is the resurrected Christ in the flesh. This is the first moment where the truth about what happened came about. Now before this they thought it was a stolen body, but no. Now she's actually met. She's witnessed Christ in the flesh. So next, Jesus will appear to the disciples. Verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. So now, you know, Sunday, the time has passed a little bit. It's now Sunday night. The disciples, they're actually still hiding for their lives. Right? When Jesus was actually taken captive, what did they do? They all ran away. They all scattered. Right? Because they had fear. They had fear that they were going to be captured and crucified as well. So they're all in hiding. And this is, you know, three days later on Sunday, Sunday night, the disciples, they're hiding for their lives, hiding inside with doors locked for fear of these Jewish leaders, thinking, oh, maybe we could be next. Maybe we'll be dragged out and crucified. And suddenly, without entering the door, Jesus suddenly appears among them. And he greets them. Just in a normal way, Hebrews greet each other. You know, this is a normal greeting. Peace be with you. And in verse 20, after he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And it's to the point where they actually thought they were seeing maybe a ghost or a spirit. They couldn't believe it. You know, but this was truly the physical presence of Jesus. How do they know that? He actually gives them proof. He gave them proof of his physical presence and identity. Evidence that they could touch, that they could actually feel. To show them that this is the same Jesus that was crucified on the cross. So he shows them, and they're allowed to touch where he was pierced by this spear on his side. They touch his wrists and hands where these nails were driven deeply into his hands. And then in verse 21, Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So you see now with the work completed on the cross, what comes next? The resurrection comes with peace for them, and also with good news to share. And so, what is he doing? He's commissioning them. He's commissioning them out, sending them out into the world to share this gospel, the good news to all people. And the important thing is, this peace that God gives us is this, that he will be with us for this work. It's all done with God. And thus, Jesus prepares them to receive the Spirit in verse 22. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And when I first read this, there's one thing that came to mind. And this is in Genesis, when God creates Adam. What does he do? He creates him from the dust of the ground. And what does he do? He breathes into him the breath of life. And he becomes a living being. And for me, this passage basically parallels that. Because that breath of life that he breathes into Adam is actually the Spirit of God. He breathes in him to the Holy Spirit. But the thing is, in reflection on the Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes in fullness, this is not the fullness of the Spirit coming to them, actually. He's breathing into them the Spirit, but it's more like a sprinkling of the Spirit. It's not the fullness of the Spirit yet. That would come later at the Pentecost. That would be the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to be with them forever. But this is the Spirit, the same Holy Spirit, that's going to give them enough to get them to that point. That resolution so they could be witnesses of Christ. It's like a little bit of that grace ahead of time to prepare them for the coming fullness of the Holy Spirit. So now, after this time with the disciples, now we're continuing on to the third point which is regarding the skeptic. And as we come to this final point, 
there's something that we really have to acknowledge as a kind of a common trait regarding something that leads a lot of our lives and basically this age that we live in. Um, it's kind of the, the philosophical thought of this age, and that is doubt. Right? Don't trust anything. Doubt everything. Um, you know, with a history of deceivers, of you know, sly, very sly and sneaky salesmen, um, in marketing, but even in religions, you know, we've come to question the motives of all strangers. Right? Whenever someone comes to your door or comes to you, even when I'm walking down the street in public, I always think, oh, they have something that they're trying to sell me. They're trying to convert me to something. It always comes to mind, right? We can't trust people. We have doubts regarding all things. Uh, I think doubt is something that's deeply rooted in us as a people these days. And that is why, for most people, what do they demand? Regarding things, they demand a personal experience. For them, things only become true if it's true for them. Have you ever heard people say that? You know, oh, that's your truth. You know, that's not my truth. You know, that's good for you, but it's not for me. It's kind of the same idea, right? It's only true if we experience it ourselves. And so, you know, Thomas, you know, he's one of those people, that he's actually more like a 21st century person living at that time. He is a skeptic at heart. He has the same doubt that a lot of people have today. And so looking at verse 24, it says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the other disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Right? Thomas, he's questioning all of this. And he's not going to be convinced, even with a simple scene of Jesus. No, he actually has to put his fingers in these cuts, in the wounds, in his hands, in the side. He wants definitive proof that this is the resurrected Christ. And you know, in all honesty, I think you know, a lot of people, they kind of think of Thomas as kind of bad. He kind of gets a bad rap as, you know, the doubting Thomas. Um, but I think this is actually good for us that we have someone like this in the scriptures. Because he is someone that's going to investigate the truth. And it lays to rest a lot of questions we have, whether or not this is simply a vision or a ghost. He is going to put it to the test. So I'm actually very thankful for Thomas. Because he gives credibility to the resurrection in the end. Is this really Jesus or someone else? Thomas basically says, you know, if I'm going to go all in and believe this, I need it to be true. And, you know, he's been listening to the words of his friends. These are people he's known, that he's been with, these other disciples, after they're sharing what they saw. But for him, he needs to experience it himself. So verse 26. A week later, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And so here comes the proof. Thomas is now present with the appearance of Jesus. And once again, we see, you know, Jesus, he comes to this room where the doors are locked. Once again, he simply appears in front of them. This is the second way that he meets them in a way that's not possible for any normal person to do. And here now, Thomas has this personal eyewitness evidence. He has seen the resurrected Jesus in the flesh. But is that enough for him? Or what does Jesus say in verse 27? Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Jesus, he knows the doubts of Thomas so clearly. Now, he never heard them from Thomas, but he knows the doubts. And he speaks even before Thomas has the opportunity to ask these questions. And this always goes back to the fact that Jesus actually knows our hearts better than we know ourselves. He addresses the questions and doubts of Thomas perfectly, instructing him to physically touch the wounds, to know that this is not a ghost, this is not an impersonator, this is truly the Christ. 
And how does Thomas respond? Verse 28. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Now Thomas, he's overwhelmed with the truth of the evidence. He now professes the resurrected Jesus Christ is his master, his Lord, and indeed God. So then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And of course, this is the greatest blessing, right? To believe and to have that faith without seeing. You know, because up to this point, everyone, all of these were witnesses. There are so many witnesses. But he's saying these words actually for us. It's for the future believers, like you and me, because this is going to be the way of salvation, through faith. But this is not an empty faith. It's not an imaginary faith. It's a faith in someone. And it's a faith supported by an immense amount of evidence. So if you have doubts, if you have questions, the point is, investigate. Because when you reveal the truth, just like the scripture says, the truth will set you free. And this is the testimony of so many people. You know, Lee Strobel, you know, he, they recently released the movie about him, right? Um, it's exactly his story. He was a, a, a reporter, an investigative journalist, who was trying to disprove um, his wife's religion because she had recently become a Christian. And as he's investigating all these things regarding Christianity, all the stories, all the things of the resurrection, he's just hit with all of the evidence. And to the point where he becomes Thomas, where he goes from complete doubt to professing my Lord and my God. And he's truly saved. He went from doubting to bending his knees to Christ and looking to him as his Lord and Master. And now this leads us to the final verse of this passage, which is also the purpose of this book, the purpose of this entire gospel, the reason why John wrote this, as an evidence of this truth. And I think it's not surprising that John adds this right after this skeptic has come to faith. The gospel is an eyewitness account and evidence of what John saw and experienced while with Jesus. It's a testimony of truth that is meant to lead you to faith. And so in verse 30, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. This gospel is written for the purpose of giving us faith. And through that faith to bring you to eternal life. Now that's the purpose of the good news. It's ultimately the word that leads to life. That this has always been the method of God. You know, if you look at the Old Testament, creation through the word. Life always came through the word. Healing came through the word. Even when Jesus was here, healing came through the word. You know, when Jesus was over the, the stormy waters, with the word he calmed the storms. With the word he brought life to Lazarus. With the word he opened the eyes of the blind. In the end, it's actually the word that is most needed for us. Because the word is more powerful than seeing and touching. The word has power to bring life itself. And I think that's true power. That's the creator of God that is at work in you. So the Gospel of John, it's a testament, it's an evidence, it's ultimately a masterpiece to remain for generations that follow. This is the unchanging method of God, to work by His Word. More than anything we can create or make, it's the Word. That's why we preach it. That's why you're all here today. So if there's one thing that I want to remain in you, more than even my Word, it's the Word of God. The Word of God to remain in you always and forever. 
And I pray that that will be your guide and your reason for living. To bring this word and this gospel to the ends of the earth. Amen. Amen. In conclusion, um, through today's passage, you know, what we looked at was some important evidence related to the resurrection of Jesus. You know, the empty tomb, the witnesses, uh, the confession of even a skeptic. But overall, this resurrection, like I said at the beginning, this is an essential part of the gospel. It's to the point where even the early church, this is a part of their first creed and their statement of faith that they professed. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, we see kind of a passage that is something that Paul is writing about, but it's kind of a, a creed, a statement of faith that he actually received. He receives it, and he's actually passing it on to people that he meets. So this is kind of like the first creed of the church. Like we go through the Apostles' Creed. This is like the first original statement of faith. So in 1 Corinthians 15, starting from verse 3, Paul says, For, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Right? So this is something he received from the other apostles, from the other disciples, and he's passing on. And this is what he passes on as first importance. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. They appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. This is the core of the gospel, right? It's the word fulfillment, witnesses, evidence of the truth. Christ died for our sins. He was buried, raised on the third day, and he appeared to many witnesses. And he actually gave evidence of that resurrection. And this truth regarding the resurrection is important to each one of us today. Because it's the truth on which all of our faith is held. You know, as I said earlier, if the resurrection never happened, if it never happened, we're all fools. We're all fools for being here and gathering. We're all fools for this faith that we have. And actually, that's what Paul continues to talk about. In 1 Corinthians 15, if you look at verse 14, in verse 14 it says, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We're even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. But that's the truth. If Christ was not raised, our faith is futile. It also means the cross is without any power. However, verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Amen. It is a fact that Christ was raised from the dead. Amen. There are many witnesses, many evidences given to show this. And this is what our faith is in. It's not in a lie. It's in the truth. It's the most important thing. And through the resurrected Christ, we have the promise and proof of our resurrection. We have the promise that we can hold on to of our eternal life in faith. Death has been defeated. Amen. Satan has been overcome. Your sin has been paid for. Amen. You are victorious through the work of Christ. Amen. It is finished, and the resurrection proves it. This is what our faith is in. The truth of God's word. Amen. Let's pray. Amen.